How many of you are, um, oh, I left it off. How many of you are familiar with Neil Gaiman's book, uh, Norse Mythology? Have you seen it? I highly recommend it to you. It is very readable. Neil Gaiman has written a number of popular books. He also has authored, uh, has created and authored some of the most more popular comic books. Um, he, he's well known for that amongst the geek community. And, uh, but then he's written a number of popular books as well. Well, he took the Norse myths that we're going to be talking about today, and he wrote a best-selling book tell, retelling those stories in a very readable fashion, and it's called Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman, G-A-I-M-A-N. I recommend that to you. Uh, if, you've, if you've not seen it, uh, once we talk about these things today, again, you think, oh, Norse Mythology, uh, I remember Greek mythology and how boring that was, but no, it's really well done, and I, I think you'd be interested in it. Norse mythology and the Norse gods that are the core of Norse mythology, interestingly, while most Westerners know very little about it, they're very much closer to us in many ways, historically, geographically, and even culturally, than the Roman and Greek gods. We've inherited a lot of other things from the Greeks, obviously democracy and philosophy and things of that sort, and because of that, there's a big emphasis on Greco-Roman mythology because the, the Greeks and the Romans uh, basically had the same pantheon of gods, they just used different names for them. But in fact, the Norse gods, again, are much closer to, Western, to the Western civilization in terms of timing and all sorts of things. Um, and yet, it, so it's a shame we don't know more about them because they really are relevant to us. These are myths that came from Germanic tribes beginning somewhere around probably the 9th century. They continued to be handed down and then were written in poetic form between the 11th century and then versions of them continued up to the 18th century. But the most common and considered probably the best versions of them are actually from the 12th century. They were written down by a, an Icelandic historian and writer and politician named, and this is an important name, it really is, you need to, need to learn this, Snorri Sturluson. You go to Iceland, they even have a popular beer called Snorri. Snorri Sturluson is the one who wrote down the Poetic Edda and the Prose Edda, which was a, he wrote the versions of the Norse mythology. He also, in the Eddas, they contain stories about King Arthur, which is one of the reasons why King Arthur is on our list of things to talk about when we're in Norway. We'll get into that a little bit later on. But Snorri Sturluson and his versions of the mythologies in the Poetic and Prose Eddas are critical records of what the ancient beliefs of the Scandinavian people. These, of course, are pre-Christian beliefs. They maintain these well up after the, uh, the rest of Western Europe had become Christianized. During the Viking Age, Britain and uh, Western Europe were already Christian for quite a long time, and they were confronted by the pagan beliefs, which is what we're talking about today, of the Scandinavian peoples. So that's what we're talking about. Let's talk, start with the creation myth. Um, before anything else existed in Norse mythology, there was a great abyss called Ganingagap. Ganingagap was this just a wide nothingness. Out of the Ganunga Gap, there developed two regions. One was called Muspelheim. It was the land of fire and lava and heat. That was on the south. On the north, there was another uh, region that developed out of, out of the abyss of the Ganunga Gap. It was called Niflheim. It was the land of ice and frozen water. Well, eventually, Muspelheim in the south, which was fire, and Niflheim in the north, which was uh, ice, began to creep toward one another across the abyss of Ganunga Gap. And when they met one another, the obviously, you know, you get uh, ice and fire together, and you ended up with this massive uh, mist. And out of the mist, there developed the first of the Jotun, or frost giants. His name is Emir. The first being, the first frost giant, who is the first being to develop out of the confrontation between fire and ice. Well, um, Ymir was a hermaphroditic being. He could uh, produce other beings without having a mate. And so as he sweated in the midst of all the steam and everything, 
his sweat turned into other giants, frost giants. So he's producing more of his own race. Um, his two legs interspingled and created other giants. And so he's producing all of these giants as he goes along. Um, the From uh, the steam also, the next being that came out, other than the frost giants, was a cow named Aldombla. This is Aldombla over here. Aldombla nourished Emir and the other giants with her milk. And she was nourished by licking the salt licks that were part of the ice that had come from Muspelheim. Well, as she licked the ice, she began to uncover a being named Buri. Buri was a, um, a god, the first of the Aesir, which is the tribe of gods that Odin and Thor and a lot of the others belong to. So she uncovered this being, and that being then married and had a child, and that child was named Bor. Now, who, you know, apparently he married a giant. We don't have a lot of Beslo was the, the person he married. He had a child, Bor, um, and they ended up having half giant, half god beings. And so they began to populate. Amongst the first of the children that Bor and Besla had were three particularly important ones. Odin, that you've heard of, he was the first of the half-god, half-giants. And his two brothers, Vili and V. I'm going to show this to you in a minute, but uh, I need to give you a little background here. So, you've got Odin and Vili and V, and here Emir is, the fr first frost giant, and he's producing more and more giants all the time. Well, um, Odin and his two brothers are not happy with the fact that there are more giants than there are gods, Aesir gods, and so they decide they need to do something about this. They figure as long as Emer is still alive, they're going to, he's going to keep producing other giants, and the giants are always going to outnumber the gods. So they decide to do something about it. They attack Emer in his sleep, and the three of them, Odin, Vili, and V, and they end up killing Emer after a horrible battle. And when Emer is killed, his blood gushes out and drowns almost all of the other giants. And so Odin and Vili and V sort of begin to take charge of everything. Most of the other giants are gone at that time. Um, they then take Emer's body and they tear it apart. And from the pieces of Emer's body, they build the world that humans will inhabit. They take, for instance, his um, blood, makes up the oceans and lakes, the, uh, his skin and muscles form the soil, the rocks and mountains are made from his teeth and bones, vegetation comes from his hair, his brains are made into clouds, and the sky is made from his skull. Well, uh, Odin, Vili, and V are concerned that the, the sky made from Emer's skull might collapse if it's not supported. Well, Emer's body, there were these worms crawling in and out of his rotting corpse as they were using it to build the world. And those worms turned into dwarves. I can't explain the processes involved in all of this. But those worms turned into dwarves, and so Odin, Vili, and V took four of the strongest dwarves, whose names were North, South, East, and West. And they made them responsible for holding up the sky, which was made out of Emir's skull. And that's where we get the four cardinal points under the sky, is from those four dwarfs. So they have this world, and Odin ends up, as he's walking along the beach one day, Odin finds two logs that have washed up on the shore of the beach. One of them is an ash tree, and one of them is an elm tree. Well, he turns them into human beings, and when he create, he gives them life, and then his brothers Vili and V give them intellect and movement and the five senses and various other things. So we have the first two humans created. They are from an ash tree and an elm tree. They are named Ask and Embla. And they take, Odin and his two brothers take Ask and Embla and put them on the, the world that they created from Emer's body, which is called Midgard, or Middle World. You know Middle Earth from Tolkien? That's basically a translation of the Norse word Midgard, which is where humans lived in the uh, Norse mythology. 
So um, another thing that, that Odin does, and this, by the way, represents up here, Ask from the ash tree and Embla from the, um, the uh, elm tree. The other thing that Odin does is he finds two young giants named uh, Saul and Manny, and he assigns them the task of driving the chariots that carry the sun and the moon. And in order to make sure that they don't ever slow down or they don't ever stop in their courses, he assigns two giant wolves, Hathi and Skoll, to chase them across the sky every night and every day. And so here you have Hathi uh, and Skoll chasing Saul and Manny um, in their chariots as they carry the sun and the moon across the sky. Now, various of these characters, never mind the pecking upstairs, I think they're mining for gold, but we'll, you know, we'll find out later. The, um, all of these various beings come into play later on. One other set of creatures I might mention, these three goddesses over here are the Norns. They are the goddesses of fate. And the, one of them is called Order. She is the goddess of what has been passed, you know, the goddess of the past. One is called Verdandi, she is the goddess of the present. One is called Skuld, she is the goddess of what has not yet been, the future. So past, present, future. They are the goddesses of fate. And they, um, the, the legends are that they are constantly weaving the tapestry that is the con thing that controls human life. And if ever they decide to snip off a thread, that's when you die, if it's your thread, okay? So they are controlling the destiny for humanity. Now all of this, you'll notice there's a whole lot of destruction and killing and, you know, uh, whatnot. It was very important to the Norse beliefs that there was a balance between um, destruction and creation, between death and life. That destruction was necessary before there could be creation. And that's how they sort of understood the struggles of human life. You know, they explain death by understanding that, you know, only after death can other life come. You know, if you had, if nobody ever died, then we couldn't support life anyway. There'd be too many of us. And so, so much of their philosophy of life had to do with an acceptance of destruction, an acceptance of death, because that was part of the cycle that then led to other life. So there really was um, a philosophical underpinning to a lot of the the ideas that came out of this cosmology or the, the uh, beliefs and mythology of the Norse peoples. Tying all this together, and our guide at the state church yesterday mentioned this, um, there is a cosmic ash tree, sort of the tree of life, which is a symbol that's existed in a number of ancient cultures. Uh, in the case of the Norse, this tree is called Yggdrasil. Um, Yggdrasil is the uh, cosmic ash tree, and it is the center of the Norse cosmos. In the various branches of the Yggdrasil are the nine worlds that exist in the Norse cosmology. Uh, each of them are the homes, the residences of different kinds of people that I'll get into in just a moment. The three roots of Yggdrasil go down and drink from three of the major worlds. Uh, one root goes to Asgard, which is the home of the Aesir. The Aesir are the gods, Odin, Thor, um, the various others. There's a second tribe of gods called the Vanir, I'll talk about in a minute. And, uh, but they're not as important or as, as numerous as the Aesir. They're the most important ones. The second root of Yggdrasil reaches down into Midgard, the home of the humans. Some legends say that it goes to, to the home of the giants, which is called Jotunheim. And then the third group goes down to Helheim, which is the land of the dead, which is run by the goddess Hel, H-E-L. Used to be when somebody said, well, you can go to Hell, they meant Helheim. They meant the Norse location of the dead. They didn't mean the H-E double hockey sticks that, you know, people think of today if they say that. So that's a very ancient kind of expression. You can go to the world of the dead. Um, the tree is tended by the three Norns that I mentioned who water it every day, the three goddesses of fortune um, and fate. The water that they pour on Yggdrasil ends up filtering down and becoming dew on the earth of Midgard. Um, the 
branches of Yggdrasil support the whole world, the whole universe. Animals feed on the branches of Yggdrasil. There is a great eagle that sits in the top of Yggdrasil and watches over everything and feeds off of the vegetation. There is a great serpent, um, the needlehog, that sits at the root of the cosmic tree and gnaws on the roots. There are various uh, hearts, deer, other kinds of animals that chew on the shoots and the branches. So there's always a, an effort to try to damage the cosmic tree, but it's always replenishing itself. And one of the favorite characters you can see right here, there is a squirrel. The squirrel's name is Ratosker, and Ratosker uh, carries rumors and insults back and forth between the various creatures in order to keep them all mad at each other. Uh, he's sort of the, the, the sneaky little guy, running around making everybody think that somebody else is saying something bad about them. The eagle in the top of the tree, uh, uh, as it flaps its wings, it creates wind for the land of the humans, so there's a lot of interaction there. Now, this is a different way of looking at the nine worlds, and here's what they are. At the top, the land of the Aesir gods is Asgard. You hear that word if you go to any of the Marvel Cinematic uh, movies. The second level down, which is the land of the light elves, is called Alfheim. Then you have Vanaheim. Vanaheim is the land of the Vanir, which are the second tribe of gods. They're like fertility gods. They're not as important as the Aesir, but they're still gods. Jotunheim, here, is the land of the giants. And they are the enemies. The giants are always trying to pull the universe, the cosmos, back into chaos, which is from which it came. And that's what the end will be, uh, the twilight of the gods, which is called Ragnarok. We'll talk about it at the very end. In the middle, Midgard, or the middle world, is where humans live. You have Muspelheim, the land of ice, and uh, Niflheim, the land, I'm sorry, uh, Muspelheim, the land of fire, and Niflheim, the land of ice, which together had created all of this uh, as they interacted in the middle. You've got Schwartelheim, which is the, uh, the world of the dwarfs, and then Hel, um, Helheim, which is the land of the unworthy dead. Someone who dies an unworthy death, they are condemned to what amounts to hell in our uh, mythology, but it's Helheim. So that's the cosmos. This is the Norse god family tree. I don't think they actually look like this, but um, you've got Ymir, the frost giant, and then he created a bunch of other giants. You've got Aldumla, the cow, who created, by licking the ice lick, created Bori, who then created Bor. They, uh, he intermarried with a giant Besla, and they created Odin, Vili, and V. From Odin, you then, he intermarries with Jord, who's also called Earth, to uh, Father Thor, and then there are other deities. You've got Hoder and Baldwin, um, the, which we'll talk about. Uh, Baldur, I mean. And then down here you get various other characters. Um, you have Loki, who is a giant, and Loki gives birth to, he fathers an eight-legged horse named Schleipnir, who becomes the horse of Odin, and because it has eight legs, it's more than twice as fast as any other horse, which sort of makes sense. Um, also, uh, Loki is the father of Hel, who is the goddess of the underworld. She's half alive and half dead. Um, the Jormungan, who is a giant serpent and Fenrir wolf. Now these are all very important characters when it comes to the end of time. Um, and those are some of the major kind of figures and I'll talk about the, the key ones of those in just a few minutes. Um, this is another way of looking at that same, same idea. Emer who then gave birth to um, the giants, Boron and uh, Besli, fathered Odin, Vili, and V. Odin was the father of Thor. He married Frigg, Baldur, Hoder, and others were their children. And then you've got Loki, who was a giant, who gave birth to Hel, the half-live, half-dead uh, uh, ruler of the underworld, Fenrir Wolf, Jormungand, the giant Midgard serpent, and Schleipnir, the eight-legged horse. The story about Schleipnir is a very funny one. Uh, the, 
a man, a human, came to the gods one time, the Acer gods, and said that he could build a wall all the way around Asgard. And it was going to be a humongous wall, and it was going to be all the way around the world of Asgard. And they said, there's no way you can do that. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, if I can do it, then I end up, and then it was an enormous treasure he was supposed to receive. It would just have bankrupted Asgard. But if I can't do it, then you'll get whatever I finish, and you won't owe me anything. Well, it turned out he had a magic horse. And his magic horse, the stallion that he had, was phenomenally strong. And he was able, he was making such great progress on this, it looked like he was actually going to be able to do it because his horse was able to bring twice as many stones, twice as fast from the quarry as they thought it was going to be. Well, they were starting to worry this guy's going to succeed. We're going to be in big trouble because when we have to pay him, we're going to be bankrupted as a world, Asgard. So they, uh, Loki comes up with the idea. Loki is a shape shifter. He can change his appearance. He decided what he would do is he, he turned himself into a mare who happened to be in heat <laughs> in order to try to distract the stallion that was making it possible for this guy to build this wall so fast. So, you know, Loki, as this mare in heat, sort of wanders over next to this stallion and then gets his interest and runs away and makes the stallion chase him. And so the guy ends up not being able to finish the wall because his horse has run off, but unfortunately, the stallion apparently was faster than Loki was because he ended up giving birth to a horse. <laughs> an eight-legged horse, Schleipnir, because the stallion caught him. And that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> but there are wonderful stories like that throughout all of this. Many of the myths and stories and things, I'm just giving you the the details of the cosmology and the gods and things, but there are wonderful stories involved in all of this. The first of the gods, which you will recognize, astonishingly, Odin looks very much like a popular actor uh, in the United States, well, Britain and the United States. Um, Odin is the king of the Norse gods. He is called the All-Father. He is the god of poetry, of battle, and of death. He is also called the Terrible One. He's the god of magic, of wisdom, of wit, and learning, of thought, and logic. And interestingly, as the very number one god, um, Odin is the only god in any mythological pantheon anywhere in the world that is a god of thought and wisdom. He's unique in that regard. The reason he has only one eye is because he gave up one of his eyes at the well of Mimir, which is the well of wisdom, in order to gain wisdom. And so he's always presented as only having one eye. Um, when we were at the state church yesterday, they mentioned the fact that there was a carved face inside the church, and they believed it to be the a carving of the face of Odin because one of the eyes had been blanked out. And that's one of the symbols for him. He also is... Um, often presented as a he'll he can change shape as well and he will present himself as an old man with a blue gray cloak and a floppy hat in order to travel around and see what's happening in the worlds he has two ravens that are always present with him you'll see here and there these two different images the ravens are called hugen which means thought and munin which means memory and he can send these two ravens, um, the Hugin and Munin, out to fly around the worlds and then come back and report to him on what's going on. He also has with him always two wolves, Freki and Gary, you know, whether they be white wolves, as down here, or black wolves, that are always seen with him. Um, the, in addition to losing an eye in order to gain wisdom, Odin hanged himself on the cosmic tree of Yggdrasil for nine days and almost died in order to gain a knowledge of runes, which means of writing. This is one of the reasons he's thought of as being the god of knowledge, of wisdom, of thought, is he was the one that learned the secret of Nordic runes and brought that back to his, his people. So he is the father of writing in that regard. Um, he can make the dead speak. He resides in the great hall Valhalla, and Valhalla is the place where all honored dead, all honorable dead, will reside. And Valhalla, if a, if a Norse warrior, a Viking, if you will, dies in an honorable death, particularly in battle, with their sword in their hand or their weapon in their hand, they will be sent to Valhalla. 
every day to be able to drink and feast and fight and other things. And if they get killed fighting against old friends and old enemies, then they will be reborn the next day and start all over again. And that's in the hall of Valhalla, which Odin is responsible for. He has a spear, Gungnir, which never misses when it's thrown. He has a magic ring called Dropmir, which every nine days cre or every eight days creates nine more rings, or every ninth day creates eight more rings. I don't remember exactly, but anyway, it's a magical ring. Um, and we, when I mentioned the fact that in many ways the Norse mythology is closer to us than Greco-Roman mythology, Tuesday, our day of the week, is named after the god Tyr or Chu in, in Old English. Wednesday is named for Woden or Odin. Thursday is Thor's day. Friday is Frigg day, or f some people believe it's Freya day. I'm gonna mention both of those. Uh, but, and then Saturday, Sunday, and Monday are named for Saturn, the, the sun, and the moon, which were all deities in the ancient pantheon as well. So our very days of the week are named after the Norse gods. Um, most people don't aren't even alert to that fact. Um, the second deity, is Frigg, who is Odin's wife. She is the primary goddess. She's the mother of Baldr, um, and in fact, she's called the mother of all. She's the protector of children. She knows the future, but she will never speak of it. And again, uh, most people believe that Friday is that was actually Frigg's day originally, although some people think it was Freya day. So she is often seen um, with Odin as being his wife. Freya is one of the primary gods of the Vanir, the second tribe of gods. She is called the Lady. Uh, she's the primary goddess of the Lady. She's a fertility goddess, the goddess of love and beauty. She's also a warrior. Um, she is a goddess of wisdom and magic, um, quite extraordinary uh, goddess. She is the queen of the Valkyries. The Valkyries are the ones that, upon the death of warriors on the field, they're the ones that come in and decide who died honorably to be taken to Valhalla and which ones will get sent to hell, or Helheim, because of died in, dying a dishonorable death. She's the one that chooses that because she is the queen of the Valkyrie. Um, her sacred symbol are cats, um, as you see, whether they be large cats or how big house cats. Um, and she has cats that draw her chariot. So cats are a symbol of Freya, who is the main goddess of the Vanir. And then, of course, we have Liam Hemsworth. Um, <laughs> you all rate for that one, weren't you? Um, this is Thor, the god of thunder. In many ways, the most popular of all the gods. In fact, in some places, Thor actually supplanted Odin as the primary focus of the Norse beliefs, uh, both because he was very much the kind of guy that, that the god that the Vikings liked because he was he exemplified their values. He's strong, brave, bold, he's a warrior, he's known for defeating all of his enemies, he lives by his own rules, so the Vikings really liked that. Uh, Thor's hammer as an amulet was often worn by Viking men as a sign of the fact that they were followers of Thor. It's also believed that probably some people liked Thor better than did Odin because Odin required human sacrifice to worship him, and Thor did not. So makes it a little easier there. Um, he's associated, Thor is associated with law and order. Uh, he's the god of the sky, of thunder and fertility. He is the guardian of the Norse gods and the protector of Midgard. He protects humans. One of the reasons why he was such a popular comic book character is he's the one that had more interaction with Earth, Midgard, and humans than most of the other Norse gods. He's always coming back and forth because he's involved in protecting human beings. He is the Thunderer, the Thunder God. He has a great hammer called Mjolnir. Mjolnir allows him to call down lightning. Uh, Mjolnir always returns to him when it's thrown. It's a, a, ter uh, a horrific weapon against his enemies. It always returns to him, and no one can pick up Mjolnir except Thor or someone who is found truly worthy. No one else can lift it. And there are funny scenes in some of the Marvel movies about Thor hanging around with his friends, you know, Iron Man and Captain America and the rest of them trying to pick up his hammer and not being able to do so. Um, in 
the, in addition to Mjolnir, the hammer, he also has a belt, which allows him to double his strength when he straps on this belt. Uh, whereas hats are the symbol or the, and, and the chariot drawers of uh, Freya, for Thor, he has two goats that draw his chariot across the sky. And when you hear rolling thunder, that's because Thor is riding his chariot across the sky since he is the god of thunder. His two goats that draw his chariot are called Tangrisni, which means gap-toothed, and um, Tangnos, which means tooth grinder. And these goats have the ability to regenerate. Uh, there are stories about the fact that Thor is traveling and he gets hungry and he stops at a farmhouse and uh, because they're all hungry and there's no food, they take the goats, kill them, skin them, cook them, and eat them. But Thor says, make sure you, you pile up the bones right here, leave the bones alone, because the bones, if they're there, the next day they'll wake up and the goats will be back. Well, unfortunately that night, uh, one of the, the farmer decides he was still a little hungry and he thought, you know, I bet there's good marrow in those goat bones. So he goes and breaks one of the bones and is sucking the marrow out of it. And the next morning, Thor realizes that one of his goats is limping, that something's not right. And he finds out that the farmer had broken one of the bones in the night. And so the farmer's son ends up being the servant to Thor in payment for the rest of time. Okay. So his Tangris, uh, Grisni and Tangnos are his two regenerating goats. Uh, Thor's greatest enemy is Jormungand, the Midgard serpent, and in the end of time, at the twilight of the gods, Jormungand and Thor kill one another. Um, we'll get there. This, of course, is Loki. Uh, Tom Hiddleston, who plays Loki, has become one of the most popular figures on the internet. He's got more fan clubs than anybody ever. Um, so, and he does a great character. Loki is the cunning, sly, trickster god. He is the son of two giants. Now, in the Marvel comics and the Marvel movies, he ends up being the foster brother of Thor. But in fact, he's not in the mythology. He is the foster brother of Odin. When they did the comics, they decided it'd be more fun to have Thor and Loki always fighting it out, rather than Loki and Odin, and so they made the change. But he is a shapeshifter, he is a sky traveler, he's the one that is always challenging the structure and the order of the gods, and is really seen as a critical character because his shenanigans are often the thing that causes the stories. You know, he'll do something, and then in try, order to try to resolve it, they have the myths associated with it. Sometimes he's seen as the one who does something that nobody wants, but ends up creating beneficial change. At various times, he puts Freya in peril and then saves her. Yes? Excuse me for interrupting, but, you know, with the wings on the helmet and the, and the horns, is that also a thing that came out of, you know, Wagnerian stuff? Or? Well, um, yes. You know, they did not have originally, you know, yeah. horn helmets kind of thing. But uh, we, we, you'll see this drawing over here, which is uh, not that ancient. It's early 20th century. And then this is, of course, the modern representation and the comic book representation. But that's not, they did not originally have horns on the helmets in the Norse idea. Um, he is the sky traveler. And so the wings on the feet kind of thing, he was able to fly um, as the sky traveler. He, at various other times, shears off the hair of Sif, who is Thor's wife, as just a joke. He thinks it's funny to cut it, you know, to have Thor have a bald wife for a while. He, um, leads, his deceit leads to the loss of the golden apples of youth, and then he recovers them. So all these stories are oriented around Loki's doing something sneaky. Um, and very important, really, in the whole mythology. The, he's dynamic, he's unpredictable, um, he is one who, he spawned, as I say, he's the father of Schleipnir, the eight-legged horse that Odin rides, plus Gormand, the Midgard serpent, uh, of Fenrir Wolf, the horrible giant wolf, and of Hel. He's actually the father of Hel, the goddess who is in charge of Helheim. He causes earthquakes, and eventually, at the end of time, he will be the one that leads giants and monsters against the gods at Ragnarok, at the twilight of the gods. Baldur is the most beautiful of the gods. You sort of get that idea looking at his face up here. He is the son of Odin and Frigg. He is gentle and wise. Everybody loves Baldur. Um, he 
ends up being accidentally killed by his blind brother, whose name is Hoder, or, oops, sorry, or Hod, it's uh, two different ways it's written. The, as the god of love and light, Balder is married to Nana, who is the goddess of joy. So you get this picture, and yet Balder begins in the midst to have dreams of his own death. He dreams that he's going to be killed. And his mother, Frigg, all the gods are worried about this because everybody loves Balder and they believe that his dreams are actually prophetic. So they all get together and they decide, what are we going to do about this? And they come up with a list of every possible way that, someone, that some of the gods could die. All the different ways you could be killed. And then Frigg goes out and she talks to every substance and being that exists in all the nine worlds. Every animal, she talks to the trees, uh, all other wood, stone, metal. She gets every substance to agree that they will not harm Balder. The only one that she overlooks, which she thinks is insignificant, is the little mistletoe plant. Well, it turns out they all agree not to harm Balder, and when they go back up, they're trying it out, and they start throwing pebbles at Balder, and they bounce off, and he doesn't feel a thing. So they start throwing bigger rocks and sticks at him, and he doesn't feel a thing. And they think this is great sport, and they're laughing and having a great time. Well, they're having such a good time, Loki gets tired of their laughter. You know, he's a grump anyway, and he doesn't want to listen to it. And so he says, I need to do something about this. He, he turns himself, he's a shapeshifter, he turns himself into an old woman. He goes to Frigg in the form of an old woman and says, oh, I was just over there, and they're stoning that beautiful young man, and I didn't want to watch. And Frigg says, no, they're not really stoning him. It's all just a joke. They can't hurt him because nothing will hurt him. And so Loki in this guy says, nothing can hurt him? She said, no, I got all the substances in the whole of the nine worlds to agree not to hurt him. And she says, so nothing at all, not even a pinch of salt. And Frigg confesses, well, the only thing I didn't get to agree was this little mistletoe plant because I didn't think it was worthy of bothering with. Loki leaves, turns back into himself, he goes and finds the mistletoe plant and gets the biggest stalk he can, sharpens it, turns it into a dart, goes back to Hoder, who is the brother of Balder, and who's just standing over by himself because he can't see. And they, uh, he's saying, well, why aren't you participating in the party? And he says, well, I, you know, I, I can't see what they're doing. It says, oh, well, they're really paying honor to your brother Balder by throwing things at him. And he says, do you want to play too? And he goes, yeah, sure, I'd like to show honor to my brother Balder. So Loki gives him this dart of mistletoe, aims him in the right direction and says, throw it. And he ends up killing Balder. And there is huge mourning. Balder is dead. You know, Balder, Balder the Beautiful is dead. It's a famous line in some of the myths. In fact, that's one of the things that apparently inspired C.S. Lewis to become such a fan of Norse mythology kinds of stuff, uh, is the, move, the moving testimony that Balder the Beautiful is dead. So he dies. He is sent to the underworld because he didn't die in battle. They send another son of Odin down to try to get him out. And Hell says, is it really true that everyone, every being is mourning the death of Balder? And um, Helmond, the brother, says, yes, it's true. She goes, well, if you can prove to me that every being is mourning the death of Balder, then I will release him and he can come back. Well, they go around, Loki turns himself into an old woman again and refuses to say that she's sad at the death of Balder. And so Balder doesn't get to come back. All of these are the kinds of myths that we deal with. A couple of other characters. Heimdall is the watchman of the Norse gods. He's the owner of a horn called Kjall. Kjall, when sounded, can be heard in all the nine worlds. He, his home is right next to the Bifrost. The Bifrost is a rainbow bridge that connects Asgard to the other worlds. And he protects it so that no one can cross without him knowing. It's said that Heimdall can see everything that is and can hear every sound, even the growing of the grass or the growing of a sheep's wool. And so he's always on guard to make sure that Asgard is protected. Well, um, he is associated with the sea. He's the, uh, said to be the son of nine maidens. Not sure how that works. But they, some people say it may have been nine waves that birthed him. He. Uh, 
eventually he is the one who is aware of the fact that the giants are attacking and sounds the horn at the end of time uh, at the Ragnarok. This is Hell, the ruler of the realm of the dead, and you will see that she is half alive and half dead. In some of the mythology, they say that she's alive from the waist up and dead from the waist down. Uh, but she's often presented like this. Um, the, she is, again, a child of Loki, as is Jormungandr and Fenrir the wolf. She is the one that rules over death, uh, maintains her kingdom over the dead, and she is considered very vengeful to anyone who transgresses natural law. Interestingly, the Vikings, the Scandinavians, really feared her. But the Germans and the Dutch and some of the other ancient Germanic peoples, who also had her as a deity, saw her as sort of the transforming death. That it was, she, she actually had kind of a positive light. That she gave meaning to some of those things. And finally, the uh, Ragnarok which is the twilight of the gods. It is the end of time. At the, toward the end, now, Jormungan, who is the great serpent, is enchained. Fenrir is enchained. In fact, Tyr, the son of Odin, lost a hand trying to finally uh, shackle the great wolf Fenrir. And so Fenrir is shackled. Loki, after killing Baldur, they lock him up when they find out he's done that. So all of them are in chains. Finally, Loki breaks free. He arranges to free uh, Jormungan, the great Midgard serpent. He frees Fenrir, and they lead both the giants and all of the residents of Hel, um, Helheim, back in an attack on Asgard. And when they attack, well, first their um, Midgard, the Earth, goes through, and this may actually be happening now, goes through a horrible winter. And then two more winters after that, with no summers in between. And so after three years of horrible cold, we end up with um, the two wolves that chase the sky and the sun, uh, the, the sun and the moon across the sky. The wolf skull seizes the sun and swallows her. And the splatter of um, gore goes as far as Asgard. Um, his brother Haki catches the moon and mangles it. The stars vanish from the sky, and eventually the earth starts to shudder. The limbs of Yggdrasil, the great tree of life, start to shake. Fenrir breaks loose. Jormungan breaks loose. There are two humans who hide in the branches of Yggdrasil. And all the sea rears up, and everything starts going wrong. The giants and the unworthy dead following Loki attack Asgard. As you can see in these images, Odin does battle against the great wolf Fenrir and is eaten by Fenrir. Odin dies in the jaws of Fenrir. Uh, Thor does battle against the, his arch, arch enemy who is the giant Midgard serpent Jormungand and he kills Jormungand but only after being poisoned by him. And it's said that after killing the serpent, Thor takes nine steps back and drops dead. So um, Heimdall is also killed, and all of these major deities are killed, and it looks as though all things will end. Well, in almost every case, it was the god and then the, you know, the giant or demon that they're fighting end up killing each other. At the end of all of this, um, the Yggdrasil is still alive. The two humans that have hidden inside the tree come back out again, um, and they end up being the two humans that restart the human race. Baldur and his brother, Hoder, come back from hell. They, they can reestablish the race of the gods. The two humans reestablish the race of the humans. The planets, uh, the nine worlds, begin to reestablish themselves, and everything starts again. This again is very much part of the kind of cosmology and, and, and mythology is that out of the destruction comes new life and new birth. The two humans are called Lith and uh, Lithrasir. Lith and Lithrasir begin to have children. Their children bear children and life begins again, not only on Midgard, Earth, but also amongst the gods that survived or were able to return after all of that. And it all begins again. So Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods, 
the end of time according to the Norse mythology. You now have an introduction in 45 minutes to all of Norse mythology. I do strongly recommend, a much better job of it than I, I can do, is Neil Gaiman's book, Norse Mythology. Questions about any of this? How many of you were Marvel fans? You know, like all of that when you were like, yes, 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 there you are. All of us geeks hang together. Um, so I love that stuff. Um, and it was such a relief, but it all started coming back. And, it, you know, intelligent, mature people could say they were fans of Thor. Because it doesn't hurt the people that got playing those characters. Yes? Um, yes, I'm sure there probably were. Yeah. Well, and this isn't this doesn't just come from Norway. We say it's Norse, but by Norse we mean northern. It actually started in Germany, you know, because the Norse people started in Germany. And so this represents that whole kind of northern Germanic mythology that started in the ninth century and then carried on. Most of it was recorded in Iceland. As I say, at least the versions we have today, by, remember the name? Snorri Sturluson. Very important name. A um, lot of stuff in, in history and mythology that's related to Scandinavia comes from Snorri Sturluson. So, uh, yeah, there would have been snakes certainly in Germany and other areas, whether they were in the far north or not. Um, so, other questions? I've scared you to death, haven't I? <laughs> now, you're all afraid that, that uh, Ragnarok is going to happen tomorrow. Yes? So, the, these allegories, although there's some people who, who believe Thor was real in things, of course, uh, the, was there wisdom dependent? There was. I mean, the various beings represented values. You know, Thor was the ideal that the Vikings um, wanted to be. They wanted to be brave and strong and defeat their enemies. And, you know, there was the, the fact that Odin was willing to give an eye for wisdom. So there was the, the belief that wisdom was to be sought and was valuable. Um, as I say, he's the only god of thought and wisdom that is the, the head of a pantheon anywhere in any mythology in the world. So the values that they represented, both the positive values that you wanted and the negative values that you had to be away, you know, concerned about and stay away from, all are represented in these beings. It's all a kind of morality play, in other words. And for that reason, um, is for our education, or the education of the Norse people. And that's, that's true with all of the Mythologies. Over here first, and then you. Yes. Chu Monday was named for the moon, which again the, the major planets. Saturday is Saturn. Uh, Sunday is the sun. Monday is the moon. Tuesday was Chu, which is one of the sons of or Tyr is the other name. Tyr is the Norwegian name for him. Chu was the Germanic name. That's where we get Tuesday. Wednesday is from Woden. His name is sometimes spelled and pronounced Woden, W-O-D-E-N, and that's where we get Wednesday. Thursday was from Thor, literally Thor's day, and then Friday is either Frigg, Odin's wife, or Freya, and there's some disagreement on that. Most people believe it was Frigg. So our days of the week come from that. Yes? Well, the, uh, most of the gods die, not all of them. Again, Balder and Hodor come back from Helheim. There are some of the gods who are still left alive. The major ones are, are dead. Uh, Odin, Thor, um, Fry uh, is killed, Heimdall is killed, but there are still some of the gods and they begin to replenish. Uh, the idea is that even though the gods have died, they sort of live forever. And um, in, in that was true with many of the Greek and Roman gods that had perhaps had been died, but they had died. But they saw them as being representative of eternal truths, and so the Vikings would pray to Thor. They would pray to the goddess of the sea in order to have safe travel. And so um, life and death didn't have the sort of oh well, we can't worship that anymore. But you know that guy anymore because he's dead now. Because as far as they were concerned, he's always going to be alive, uh, even though according to Ragnarok, Thor and Odin and Heimdall uh, all die. <laughs> Okay, um, I can't like I can't make sense of it beyond that. You know, just like I can't understand how an eight-legged horse was born from uh, Loki the giant. You know, it's, um, it's kind of strange. It's like in, in Indian mythology. You know, one of the one of the most popular gods of all, um, Ganesha, is a god with an elephant head who rides on a mouse. 
just take it for what it is. That's about all you can say. <laughs>